In its ambition to make Europe climate neutral by 2050, the European Commission led the rollout of era-defining legislations during its current term, and it aims to mobilize at least one trillion euros in sustainable investment over the next decade. As the European Green Deal faces political headwinds in the run-up to the 2024 elections, what does its future look like? This is what we discussed at the WEF session. European Green Deal? Anyone? Prime Minister of Greece, Kyriakos Mitsotakis. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Executive Vice President for European Green Deal from the European Commission from Brussels joining us, Maro Sefcovic. Thank you very much for being here. Esther Bajet, President and Chief Executive Officer Novo Zymes in Denmark, Alliance of CEO Climate Leaders. Thank you. And uh, Maxim Timchenko, Chief Executive Officer DTAC Ukraine. Uh, Prime Minister, against the backdrop of European elections in a few months, uh, <coughs> political headwinds that the Green agenda is facing. Are you more bearish or are you more bullish about the future of the European Green Deal? I continue to be profoundly bullish about the future uh, of the Green Deal because when this uh, discussion uh, started a few years ago, I mean, the main argument uh, in support of the Green Deal uh, had primarily to do with the uh, importance of reducing emissions uh, uh, in order to protect the environment. Uh, we've been uh, uh, subject to catastrophic floods, for example, this, this summer, the necessity to play a leading role uh, in this transition. Since then, we've had a geopolitical shock. And it has also been uh, in incredibly clear that uh, some of the solutions offered by the Green Deal also make profound economic sense. Just uh, look, for example, at, uh, at Greece, our penetration of renewables, how cheap renewables are. I mean, there are hours during the day when we actually have uh, uh, negative prices. So I think there is uh, a, a general understanding that we need to push forward um, with this uh, agenda. Thank you so much. Uh, Executive Vice President for the European Green Deal, Interinstitutional Relations and Foresight European Commission, Mara Sepkic, your view on that. I am more bullish and bearish. I'm, of course, uh, uh, <laughs> I'd be surprised if you were bearish. <laughs> yeah. and yet, I am bullish and I am in a, in a, in a category which I, which I understand it's... Uh, um, described by the political scientists as a happy warrior you know i mean being in this business you uh, you have to be you have to be optimistic because uh, uh, you see you know what kind of uh, um, what kind of distance we have already covered every single year every single summer we are reminded that we have only one planet and uh, that these weather related disasters are bearing more and more cost uh, lots of human tragedies and simply there is no alternative so that's i would say the very big picture but coming you know to the economic aspect of it I mean, the, for Europe, the Green Deal, it's our growth strategy, and through the Green Deal, uh, you see that there is actually huge international competition about what I would describe future-oriented technology. And what we need to develop is stronger business case for, uh, for the Green Deal, for our, for our investors. You have to be in close interaction with our citizens. Uh, therefore, we started with the Green Dialogues. We have to listen to the CEOs of the companies across across the Europe, mm -hmm. because they will tell you, you know, we can do much more if you would remove this technological block, or if you would create real single market uh, for, the, for the Green Deal, or if we simply buy uh, uh, state aid, support this or that technology, because it's uh, not that mature. And I think there you see that we are also doing a lot of re uh, rethinking, because we have to react on what is happening on, on the global level. The massive subsidies offered by IRA in UIs, of course, massive subsidies uh, 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 by which China is supporting its exports also to, towards Europe. So we are, we are adjusting uh, our policies as well. And I was quite happy that last week we did this first landmark decision uh, where uh, we authorized the state aid uh, for, the, for the North Vault uh, to build the next gigafactory in, uh, in Europe and not, uh, not in the EUS. Well, you said uh, we need to listen more to the CEOs. Let's do that. Uh, Esther Vajet, President and the Chief Executive Office of Novozyme Denmark, Alliance of CEO Climate Leaders. Bearish or bullish? It's this uh, situation that we're living today. It shows the value of de-risking, the value of uh, having optionality, the value of resilience. Our dependence to fossil base, it's way too strong. And we need to bring alternatives. The peak of fossil-based solutions, it's just here. The era of fossil-based solutions, it's over. So now is the time to even bolder and start investing faster on that solutions of the future, of the new era. Green Deal, it's moving all of us in the right direction.
we companies, we have the responsibility to sit at the table and show what we think good looks like. There are unnecessary roadblocks that make our life complex for not, no value. Let me give you a couple. We invest in uh, collectively 8 trillion US dollars per year subsidizing the past. 8 trillion US dollars, that's 8% of the global GDP. It goes into subsidiaries into fossil-based solutions. You don't, it's not that we're not subsidizing the future enough, it's that we're subsidizing the past. We have regulation that creates unnecessary roadblocks. It takes six years to get the permit for a windmill. It takes six to eight years to, re to register a microbe to replace fertilizers and bring sustainable agricultural. It's much faster in US. So in US it takes maybe two years mm -hmm. to register a microbe to replace fertilizers. So it's, yes, the competition with IRA from a subsidiary's point of view. There is an influx of uh, investments from Europe going into into us, into us, close to 30 projects were announced since IRA. Being a European company, we're investing in US. It's not because of the subsidiaries, it's because of the demand, it's faster there. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Maxim Timchenko, Chief Executive Officer, DTAC Ukraine. Bullish or bearish? Absolutely bullish. Good. And I can say from corporate, corporate side, I think every single energy company incorporated Green Deal goals and mechanisms into, into their strategy. But from perspective of Ukraine, it's even more important. Uh, second month of full-scale invasion, we uh, asked the world to help us. And specifically talking about synchronization of our electricity and connection of Ukrainian electricity grid with European. And the request was, please help us now and we will help you in the future. Help you in building energy security of European Union and bringing more green power from Ukraine. We have enormous potential in wind and solar. Uh, we have developed infrastructure. We can be the place, as President Zelensky already said, green energy hub for Europe. Thank you. Uh, Prime Minister, let me continue with you. You mentioned during the COP28 that Greece can be provider of energy security for many European countries. How will the geopolitical landscape impact the continent's move towards green energy? First of all, may I address a very interesting point yeah. uh, that, that was made, um, uh, which I think we need to, uh, to register and listen very carefully to the business leaders developing innovative green uh, solutions. What you mentioned, I think, is particularly uh, important when it comes to uh, regulation and uh, leveraging the full potential of the single market. Uh, when you tell us that uh, it takes, uh, for example, two years to obtain the necessary registration in the US versus six years in the European Union. This is something we should take note of because we talk a lot about the single market. It is our main uh, advantage uh, when it comes to convincing companies that they should invest in Europe. But if there are bureaucratic uh, restrictions uh, uh, or bottlenecks of this type, uh, then we will be in a position of disadvantage rather than advantage when it comes to encouraging companies to invest in Europe with a primary focus on the European market. So I think this is something that we should take note of. And as we go into the next cycle of the European elections, and as we all roll out our agenda for the next uh, five years, the completion of the single market, which may seem mundane, uh, boring, bureaucratic, uh, not something that uh, may move uh, um, the, the masses towards a common goal, is something which uh, should be very, very high on our priorities. Now, sorry for the digression, um, uh, because I thought the point that you raised was very, very important. Let me uh, come back to your question. Um, energy, um, security, and what could Greece's role be in this evolving uh, landscape? Uh, uh, we uh, are currently a net importer of energy. And just to put this into context, uh, when Greece decided four years ago to aggressively move away from coal, <coughs> we decided to use natural gas as a transition fuel. Uh, we don't have a nuclear, uh, so it was the only uh, obvious uh, choice. So we spent 7 billion euros in 2022 importing natural gas. And normally this uh, bill is one billion, just to put things um, into, uh, into context. Uh, so we said that in the short term, we want to be an energy um, uh, provider um, uh, for at least the Balkans, 
by building strong uh, interconnections, uh, pipelines, floating storage and regasification units uh, in northern Greece, leverage our uh, unique uh, geographic um, uh, potential, uh, possibly uh, even, if necessary, export um, uh, gas up to uh, Ukraine, because uh, if you actually look at the map, the distance uh, is, is not that far. But in the medium to long term, we aspire to be uh, exporters of green uh, energy by harnessing the significant potential that we have, in particular when it comes to offshore wind. If you look at the map uh, of, uh, of the Mediterranean, uh, the place where you have the maximum amount uh, of, uh, of sustained, uh, constant, strong winds is the Aegean um, Sea. So a part of our uh, medium to long-term plan is to really make a breakthrough when it comes to offshore wind. But in order to do that, we also need to be the necessary interconnections. Uh, finally, we should also look at uh, the interconnections with Africa. Um, Africa has uh, significant, if not unlimited, potential um, to produce um, um, green uh, energy, particularly uh, from solar. We are in discussions with Egypt to build uh, a, uh, an interconnection um, that will connect uh, um, Greece uh, to, uh, to Egypt. And of course, I think these are all projects that should be within the project of European common interest uh, uh, framework because they're not particularly important just for Greece or important for Europe as a whole. Vice President. What I think it's uh, very important indeed is that uh, we have to uh, get our sequencing better. So we invested a lot uh, in, um, uh, in renewables. I mean, the last year we've been very proud that for the first time we produced more energy from renewables than for fossil fuels. But uh, uh, Prime Minister knows very well that very often all that potential of wind and solar we cannot use. We have so-called curtailment because our grids are not able to carry the, the, the electricity to the, to the final consumers. Because the grids do not have that capacity or because we lack <coughs> enough uh, um, interconnectors uh, uh, in, in Europe. And therefore, I think we, we really need uh, to make sure that we would be investing in the grids and building them uh, to be ready, not for the next year, but to be ready for the climate neutral future for 2050. Because we simply need to upgrade the grid in a way uh, which would be ready for the, uh, for the uh, climate neutral future. And coming to the technological uh, roadblocks, uh, I totally agree with you that we need uh, to focus on it as a, as, as a laser beam because I see it in, in, in uh, many aspects. We've been not too cautious or we kind of developed uh, uh, the legislations or the, or the technologies uh, several years ago and simply the investment is, is, much, is much faster. So now we are creating new uh, opportunity. Uh, uh, we, we propose so-called uh, Net Zero Industry Act where a big part of it is what can we do with the fast permitting. We want mm -hmm. to use the overriding uh, public uh, interest principle, which would help us uh, to move much faster, which uh, would, would uh, motivate us in the Commission, but also our member states, that if it comes for the strategic project, there will be sort of one-stop shop where we would help with the permitting, where we would be able to provide, I would say, the guidance uh, to the market operators. How can we help you with different funds we have? Uh, in, in Europe because sometimes it's very complex and you really need, uh, you know, the, some kind of uh, agency to help you with, uh, with, with, all the, uh, with all that advice, just simply to, to make things uh, uh, much, much faster. And last point on a uh, uh, single market for the Green Deal, I totally agree with the, uh, with, the, with, the, with the Prime Minister. The single market brought Europe success thanks to the single market removing the internal barriers among the member states. We actually grew up the, the biggest uh, economy in the, in, in the world, and we have to make sure that it's also uh, fine-tuned to this uh, new economy of the 21st century, which is uh, built on the green technology. I'm particularly happy that we managed gradually to link up more and more Ukraine mm -hmm. uh, to the single market. Maxim Timchenko, let's go to you now with the EU leaders deciding to open the accession negotiations with Ukraine in December 2023. How can Ukraine contribute to supporting the continent's decarbonization efforts and the future energy security, both as a future member and today as well? On the first day of full-scale invasion, we disconnected from uh, Russia and Belarus uh, electricity grid. It was part of our uh, three-day testing as part of our synchronization process, which should be taking place in 2025. And I think that, that that day we disconnected forever. 
I am so grateful to our European partners, European Commission, and to all parties involved that in three weeks' time we managed to connect. It was emergency connection, but it still helped us to survive because we get some electricity out of Europe. And of course, after this moment, historical moment for, for our sector, we, we stated, now it's time for us to think how we can help Europe. Mm -hmm. And even now, during two years of war, we really do that. Our company built a 114 megawatt wind farm during the war, invested 200 million euro. Just one month ago, we announced uh, the second phase of this wind, wind farm, uh, investing 450 million with support of uh, Denmark and, and supply of turbines from Vestas. During uh, the war, we restored transmission line with Poland so that we uh, improve our interconnection. Just some examples of what can be done during the war and what role Ukraine can play, even under current circumstances. So I think that Green Deal and all the goals we, we discuss here will be driving force for Ukraine. And I think most of economic reforms we need to do one or other uh, way they're connected with the European Green Deal. And basically, that's, that's the foundation of our future. With the legislative framework for the European Green Deal, if we're talking on this, is largely set, I want you to comment on how can its implementation be accelerated in a socially just way. Uh, Maxim, could you, uh, Maxim Timchen, could you, could you please comment on this? On Because Ukraine has another... It's a different dimension when it comes to the social just way of implementing the transition. Absolutely. Uh, we are in a situation where we have, have to balance. Coal mining and, and coal power generation play a crucial role in national security at the moment. And we have thousands of coal miners working in Ukraine at the moment. From the other side, Ukraine is committed to follow all uh, standards and regulations coming from Europe. So for us, it's extremely important that it's done in a fair way for the next 10 years. We don't ask for exclusion from the rules, but we, we need some time for that. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, taking, uh, taking as an example our company, we are the major coal producer in the country, but at the same time we are the major renewable company. And it takes us many years to move from coal to renewables, wind and solar in Ukraine and building battery storage. So as it was already mentioned, Ukraine is playing a very important uh, role in security of Europe. So we, we talk about energy security, definitely defense, it's clear for everybody. Food security has already was said, but I think Ukraine can play an important role in supply chain security, moving production to Ukraine. And that's another example how the social way, how we can train our people released from, from coal industry or other industries not, not aligned with, with the green and, and build new, new production, new manufacturing solar panels or parts of wind turbines or, or, or any, any other way with such a skilled people with, with uh, such a background in engineering, in production we, we have in the country. We have to continue to stay firm on where we're going without blinking. But then we should not jump unconsciously. There is a strong dependence to fossil base that we cannot simply ignore. Then the investments need to be for the future. Every single investment needs to be for green energy, for solar, for wind, for methane, for power to X. Injecting the, ca the cash, the investments, on the ca these precious dollars, these precious euros, on the solutions of the future. Same for food, for agriculture, investments on regenerative agriculture, investments on plant-based protein, investments on what are we going to move faster to this moving the air of fossil base behind us. This should be a gradual move. And that will generate growth and that will generate jobs. Thank you, Prime Minister. Would you want to build public support? Start with the obvious win-win solutions. Retrofitting houses, for example, is a win-win um, uh, uh, proposal. Uh, we have used uh, European funds uh, um, very effectively uh, in, in this direction. Or go to a small island and explain to them why decarbonizing is actually easier than they think. If you build a PV plant, there may be some resistance at the beginning, but when they see the electricity bills and they realize they pay much less uh, for electricity, you will start building uh, support. So start with the quick wins and be very careful with agriculture because agriculture in its own uh, is a very, very complex topic, very difficult to, um, to, to decarbonize, and we need to be very sensitive when it comes to reactions from our farmers.
Uh, thank you very much. Thanks a lot to the speakers and thanks for everybody here.